Hello, and thank you for joining us again. This is uh, Les Pate. I'm your host, and we will be studying 1 Samuel chapter 28. Of course, I'm with Linwood Community Church here in Barstow, California, and I hope that you have enjoyed uh, your lessons up to this point. Um, last week, we left off at chapter 27, and we found that, that um, David was living in the territory of the Philistines, and he'd been there for approximately 16 months, and uh, he has come to the point now where he has been uh, deceiving the king, Achish, telling him that the raids that he has been making has been on uh, the Israelites, when in fact he was raiding uh, Philistine territories, and Achish has believed him up to this point. Now we come to this chapter, which is very interesting, and we're going to find the two main characters here that are in a situation that I called a, a, a between a hard place and a rock. Uh, David is going to be put there, and we'll see that in a moment, and so will Saul. And then there will be a third person, but the two main characters will be in a, in a position where they're going to be held responsible for their actions words and deeds of the past. And before we do that, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time and opportunity that we can delve into your word. We thank you for the time that is spent uh, studying, uh, that we can glean a little more and a little more on what you expect of us as being children of yours and being a, a man of your own heart, Lord. But that is always glean to the fact that you are testing us and helping us too at the same time. Lord, we see in this coming chapter that uh, David and both Saul are being held uh, for, their, for their thinking and their, their doing. And uh, it's interesting uh, to me anyway. And Lord, I just ask that you have your blessings upon this lesson plan. We you would give your blessings upon those who are watching and for those who have actually done their lessons and Lord we just give you all the honor glory and praise as we continue our study of David a man after your own heart in Jesus name amen now as I'd said last week these last few verses actually read like a, a mystery novel uh, it leaves you full of intrigue and suspense and the, these next couple, three uh, lessons are no different. And by saying that, I want to get right into this because these first two uh, verses in chapter 28 it will leave us in suspense and intrigue. And by that, I'll, I'll explain in just a moment. Turn to your Bibles in chapter 28, 1 Samuel, verse number 1. Now it happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, You assuredly know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. So David said to Achish, Surely you know what your servant can do. Now some of your Bibles might say that surely your servant will show you what I can do, but it means the same. And then uh, it goes on, it says, And Achish said to David, Therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. In other words, he's going to make him, um, oh, as Saul had had to, uh, his, um, <laughs> I forget the word. Anyway, uh, he, he's been put in a position of guarding uh, the king, as we saw in uh, it was David and Saul. Here we see here he is going to be a main person to guard Achish. Uh, these are highly respected positions and highly trusted. But here is the dilemma that you're going to see in these first two verses. One is this. Now, David has been able to do these sorties, these raids down into the southern part of the Sinai and report back to Achish that he is going into the Negev of this and he's going either into the wilderness of that and never given Achish a definitive answer of who he's attacking. And by doing that, he kills everyone so that there would not be a report back to Achish that, that David is actually killing the Philistines and continuing on the work that 
was laid out for Joshua. And we see that here, but he's not telling Achish all of the story. Now it comes to the point where he's going to have to pay. You want to dance? You've got to pay the fiddler. Well, here, Achish has allowed him in his land, into his country, for the 16 months. And he is saying, you will now ride with me. And you will ride with me as my ally. He is completely convinced that uh, David has defected from his home country, his home people of the Israelites, and that he is truly uh, adhered by the Israelites, and he feels that he can trust David completely. And he makes him uh, one of his, uh, uh, I still lost the word, um, eh, anyway, uh, uh, favored uh, protectors of him, and I, I really have forgot the word I wanted. But anyway, uh, he appoints him as his bodyguard. That's what I was looking for. And uh, he is now going to have to prove to him that he is either fighting with him or prove that he is not. And is he going to be a man of honor and ride with Akish and fight against his own countrymen? Or will he be or will his disguise really be disclosed? And we really won't find that out here because the verses stop, and then it goes to Saul and his predicament. We see this predicament. David is in between a hard place and a rock. We won't find the answer out. You have to stay tuned, or if you want to cheat, you can <laughs> study your next couple, three lessons. You'll find out for your own. But come back. We'll find that out. Then we drop down to verse number three. And the reason why the writer writes this verse is to lay a background uh, so that you'll understand the position that Saul is in. And sometimes desperate people do desperate things. And you have to have a commentary or a background to understand why Saul is going to do what he is about to do. And verse three is going to help explain that. So let's go to verse three. And it says here, now Samuel had died. We knew that. Chapter 25 tells us that Samuel had died. And all of Israel had lamented for him and buried him in Ramah. We know that. That's his hometown. And this is where um, he had a school for uh, up-and-coming uh, priests. Uh, and this is in his own city, which it says. And Saul had put the mediums and the spiritus out of the land. Now, here is the situation. At times, Saul did do good things upon the Lord, and he did follow God's instructions, but quite often he would not. He would do it his way, or in some ways he would pick and choose of what he wanted to do, just like we do sometimes with the commandments of God. Well, I like this one, but I don't like that one. And we follow what we want to do. And sometimes Saul would try to outguess God. And, but here, Saul did follow, and he chased out or killed the mediums, the spiritualists, the, the witches. And now he is in a predicament. Why? We're going to find that out because of number four and continuing on into this chapter. Verse four. Then the Philistines gathered together and came and encamped and Shunem. So Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped in Galboa. Now, if we look at these areas on a map, and I know we don't have one, but uh, they're, they're in the Jezreel Valley is where they are. And Jezreel you can find fairly easy. But if we look at Shunem, it is about, oh, three miles north um, of Jezreel and near the, the Mount of Galboa. And if we look and see where Saul is and his men are encamped uh, at Galboa itself, that's about three miles southeast of Jezreel. So we have this separation of about six miles. And what's interesting about this area is that the uh, Valley of Jezreel has always been a major battling ground throughout history. And why of that? Because there were two major uh, trade routes that intersected or crossed right there at Jezreel. 
And what it was is you had a major uh, trade route coming from the Mediterranean uh, through going over to the Jordan, uh, Jordan uh, River Valley. That was from west to east. And then we see the next major tra uh, trail or uh, route was from uh, Syria, uh, Phoenicia, or Phoenicia, or well, Syria, I'll leave it right there. And it would go south into Judah, and then Judah all the way into Egypt. And it intersected, it crossed here. And it was always an area that wanted to have control over those trade routes so that you could um, tax the merchants and so on and so forth. And there were several major battles there. Well, here's where they've converged. They're about six miles apart, and they're ready to go to war. Now, let's look at uh, verses 5 and 6. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him. And here we go. Either by dreams, or by Urim, or by the prophets. Now, these are the three major ways that uh, people would seek God's advice. They would go by dreams, and we know that quite often we see this many times throughout the Old Testament and even in the New Testament where a person would go into a dr deep dream and God would come to him and speak to them. Well, he could not get an answer from his dreams by Urim. Now, here is a very interesting part is because if you remember back <coughs> when Saul had killed all the priests at Nob. There was 85 of them. And now the priests of there are no more. There's only one left, and that's Abiathar. And he is now in the camp of David. And he took the Urim and the Thummim with him. And there weren't any more. And the priests at that time abandoned Saul, if there were any left. And they withdrew their following of Saul because of what he had done. And they are now in the camp or on the side of David. God's chosen person. So he could not even get a Urim. So what does he do? In my opinion, if he says he has tried this, he's made it himself. And again, this is a direct violation of God. Only the priests were to use these. And again, he has violated his position as king and took upon himself to be the high priest. He did that once before, and he got chastised for it. This is why we see that once you start this road, you're going into a road of disaster. He, God's not going to answer that. It's a fake. Now, we re remember there are two stones that are made of onyx and how the communication was done by casting them. I really don't know, and I don't believe that there is a definitive answer on how the urine was actually used, but it was. And it was a way of communicating with God to pass to the person who was asking, in this case, the king. He tried it on his own. It failed. And then by the prophets, there weren't any. Saul's dead, and he's killed off 85 or more priests. And if there were any left, they're not going to go around Saul because they have abandoned him for what he had done. Now, what this is, to me anyway, Saul now knows that the Lord has truly removed his blessings. He is a desperate man, and desperate people will do desperate things. So let's go on down to uh, verse 7. Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a medium of all things to do. These are so much against the old Mosaic and Levit uh, Levitical laws. He is going to violate the very laws that God had laid down and I'm going to read you three of them in just a moment so that you can understand where and why God has removed his blessings from Saul, especially at this time. This is the time that he's going to have to pay for the iniquities that he has performed against God. Okay, and he says that I might go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, in fact, there is a woman who is a medium and endure. Now, in order to understand a little bit about that verse, um, first we need to know where Endor is. It's about three miles in 
the Philistine territory. So not only is she going to have to leave the comfort or the protection of the Israel territory, he has to, and we'll find out here in a second, disguise himself and go into enemy territory. But what is fascinating here is he knows the laws because verse 3 of this verse of this chapter tells us that and Saul had put the mediums and the spirits out of the land. He knows better than this, but yet he's going to do it his way. And what he wants to do is bring up the dead. And that, by the way, is called uh, uh, necromancy, and that is strictly taboo uh, with God. Now, what I said, I wanted to share with you three of the areas of um, why. And if we look, and I think I put this down as some reference points for you to study in your study guide. And I want to read, or pretty much paraphrase anyway, uh, Deuteronomy 18.10 through 11. And it says, God did not condone witchcraft soothsayers or one who interprets omens, sorcerers, or one who conjures spells, or mediums or spiritualists, or one who calls up the dead. Deuteronomy 18.10 through 11. And then we have this one. This is Leviticus 19.31. Give no regards to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them. Do not be uh, to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. He's in violation again, 1931, uh, Leviticus. And then finally, uh, and there's more references that we could to turn to. We even find these uh, uh, taboos that you're not, even in the New Testament. And I don't want to go into that right yet, but they're there too. And this one finally is the one that really violates everything that, that Saul knows. And he says, a man or a woman who is a medium or who is, was familiar with familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones, and their blood shall be upon them. Leviticus 20 and 27. Why is that interesting and why is that important? Because of what Saul is about to do. Okay, verse 28, or uh, verse 28, uh, <laughs> verse 8 of chapter 28. So Saul, why does he have to do this? He disguised himself and put on other clothes. Why? He's going into the enemy territory. And we're going to get, I, I think there's some other reasons too, and I'll get to that in just a moment. And he went, and two men with him. It doesn't say who, I don't really know who. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one I shall name or uh, name to you. Well, disguise? Absolutely. Why? Well, uh, he doesn't want his men, his troops, to see that he is possibly sneaking out of camp. Maybe he wants to desert them, but I, I don't think that's the reason. But he does not want to do something in violation that he knows is wrong. So he's going to disguise himself. The second reason, he's going into an enemy camp where he could possibly be recognized. If he has his royal robes and all of that on, well, uh, believe me, uh, the enemy's going to see that and capture him. So he doesn't want to do that. So, and it also, it shows how badly Saul was disturbed about this battle. You know, he was fearful in his heart. And it's desperate again. Desperate people will do desperate things. And this is desperation time for Saul. Why? Because he has not been able to contact God. 9 and 10. Here we go. 9 is, Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? Then 10, and Saul swore, here is the problem. You are to kill them, not save them. And Saul swore to her by the Lord. He takes an oath of all things. As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. 
Saul will use anything to his advantage, and whether it be from God or, in this case, from a, uh, from a medium. He was always there to comfort himself. He wanted to make sure that he had the upper, uh, the upper position. Uh, and we could see that even when he went after David. Uh, he was very comfortable in going into war when he was in control. You know, we have 3,000 men against 300. He was in control. He was very comfortable with that. But here he looks out at this vast number of army and he becomes scared. Well, I can understand that. And, you know, he is in his dotage years now, too. And perhaps uh, he's afraid that this is just my, it could be his last battle. He, and it is, by the way. But perhaps he's thinking that, too. But he is desperate. And he, will, he goes to her and he call and tells her to bring up a spirit. Well, he, she says, well, how come you're laying a snare for me? What that is telling me is that she recognizes his clothing. He has Israelite clothing. He has an accent of an Israelite. And it reminds me of the time when Peter said to uh, Jesus, I will not forsake you. I, I'll stay with you. I'll die with you. And, and Peter, uh, Jesus says, hey, you, you, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. And how do we know this? Because he follows and this young girl says, aren't you? I can tell by your clothes. I can tell by your accent. You are with him. You're from there. And Peter denies it. Here is the same situation. Saul dresses up, but he does not dress up as one of the locals. And, of course, he can't change his accent. She recognizes that. And you're trying to lay a snare for me. You're going to have me die get killed. 13, 11 and 13. Uh, then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? There's the big question. And he said, bring up Samuel for me. Samuel's dead. He's saying, bring up the dead. Narco, uh, uh, necromancy, bringing up the dead. That was so against God's law. Why? Because you are putting your, tr your trust in satanic power rather than putting your trust into God. That's why. He says, bring up Samuel for me. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried out in a loud voice. She was just as surprised because she knew she didn't have the power to do these things. She is afraid. She cries out, what's happening here? This isn't the satanic power that I, had, I thought I had. This is something more than that. And I want to discuss that in just a second in a little more detail because I really cannot give you a definitive answer of these verses that are about to hear here. And when the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. She, she could see through this ruse that Saul has put her through. And did she bring up Samuel? That is really the question. And there, this has been baffling to many people and a lot smarter than me for, for many years. And the only thing that I can tell you is we'll find out in just a moment what is going to happen here. Why have you deceived me for you are Saul? And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What did you see? Or obviously... If he's asking her, what did you see? He didn't see it, but she somehow has because he says, describe it to me. And she said, uh, is, what did you see? And the woman said to uh, Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. Okay, then we go on 14. So he said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. Uh, in some of your Bibles, we'll say a robe. And Saul perceived. Now, here is the thing. He perceived that it was Samuel. And he stopped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now, a lot of psalm readers, palm readers, psalmists, crystal gazers, witchcraft, all of that, even today is playing on your emotions 
and they can read you very good. Uh, some of them are very good at it. They call themselves clairvoyant. It isn't that. They can read you. They read your face. They can read your eyes. They can read what you're saying. And they will tell you what you want to hear. And oftentimes it is in such a, a question form that is answered by another question. And they can continue on doing this until you are convinced that they, that they know who you are trying to contact. This is something that has been going on for hundreds of years. Now, I've never told you this part before, but my family, my mother's family especially, were, from, were gypsies, and they ran in the carnivals. My grandmother, whom I never met, but I have many, many stories that my mother would tell me and my aunt. She was a palm reader, and she was a spiritualist and a tarot card reader. She could do this and convince people that she knew what you wanted and she would go along with this simply by asking you the questions, leading questions, and you would fall into that trap. Now, I don't believe in it. I think it's a hoax. But here, again, is the things that we have to discuss. Did she bring up Samuel? And here is what I wrote down. And this is from an acc accumulation of a couple, three Scholars much more wise than me, one of them being Dr. Sam, um, Jeremiah. And I wrote this. The appearance of Samuel has been explained by conservative uh, theologians either by it being a hoax, a demonic uh, impersonation of Samuel, or as a genuine appearance of the prophet. Take your pick. But whatever view one holds... I think you can safely say that God, not the spiritualist, was in control. God was in control. Why? Because of a conversation now that Samuel and Saul have. And he now can communicate directly with Samuel. And <clears throat> like I say, this has been a controversy for years and years and years. I'm just a simple lay person. I cannot give you a definitive answer of what happened here. But I do know this, that God truly was in control. So whichever position that you take, hoax, dynamic, uh, a, a demon impersonation, or it was Saul himself, uh, regardless of what your position is, I do believe that God was in control. And these are one of those questions that when you get to heaven, ask God. He'll, he'll explain more for you. Now, 14. I think, so he said to her, what form? We know that, and we just did that. And um, we'll go down to 15. Now, Samuel said to Saul, here is the conversation, and this is why I think this was really tr uh, Saul. But let's see. Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? He says, why are you pestering me? I'm dead. Why are you violating the Levitical laws? Why are you doing this, Saul? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by, by prophet nor by dreams. He failed to tell him by Urim. Therefore, I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. Well, he's trying to put Saul in a, a spot too, you know. He's in a position of a hard, uh, between a hard case and a rock. He's trying to put Saul in the same position. Saul's not going to fall for that. He's going to say, what? And you'll see what his answer is here. Then Samuel said, so why do you ask me? Why are you asking me? Seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy. How would you like to have the prophet telling you that God has departed from you completely and you are no longer, you are his enemy. Enemy. I think that, that would be the most frightening thing that I could ever want to hear. Being the enemy 
of God. And the Lord has done for himself as he has spoke by me. Now he's going to explain a little bit here. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. Remember, we discussed this when Saul had uh, gone against uh gone against God's commands. And the first time he, he told him that I'm going to remove your family from being inheritance of the kingdom. And then after the battle of Amalekites, which we're going to see here in just a second, Saul goes to him again. He says, I'm going to remove uh, my blessings from you, Saul, and I'm going to give it to a man of my own heart. And he didn't tell him who at that time, but he knows now that it is David. He knew it before this time. And now Samuel is, is reiterating what he already knows. And then he goes on. He says, the Lord, he says, for David, then 18, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. In other words, it's time to pay up. You did not completely destroy Amalek. In fact, you did what you wanted to do. You kept the king, Agag. You kept the spoils, the best. And you kept those for yourself, even though you lied and said you were going to use those as a uh, worship, which it wasn't. And then, well, why do you have the king then? You didn't destroy him. And that's when Samuel had to do the work that Saul should have done and put the king to death. He says, therefore, the Lord has done this thing for you today. He has removed everything, and now my blessings are away from you. You will truly know what is going to happen because he says, moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel from you in the hands of the Philistines. How do you like that blessing? There isn't one. That's pretty bad news, but there's more to come. Listen to the rest of this. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. To Saul tomorrow, you're going to die. And the sad part, too, is David's best friend, Jonathan, is going to die with him. The Lord will also deliver the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Those who survive this war Saul will be captured and enslaved and be put into the camp of the Philistines. How would you like that on your shoulders, knowing that you're going to go to battle? We know how Saul felt, because in verse 20 it says, Immediately Saul fell, fell full length on the ground, and was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel, and there was no strength in him, for he had had uh, eaten no food all day and all night. In other words, he was fasting. But everything, emotion, everything was drained from him because he now knows that not only is he going to lose this battle, he is going to lose his life, and he's going to lose his sons. And so he is emotionally and physically drained, and he falls to the ground. And then in 21, it says, And the woman came to Saul and saw that he was severely troubled and said to him, Look, your maidservant has obeyed your voice, and I have put my life in my hands and heeded the words which you spoke to me. In other words, you promised me that you would not have me harmed. You gave me your promise. Get up. Don't die here. Because if you do, my, my, I will, I, he, she's in a, a catch-22 also. Because my life was put into your hands. Get up. And then 22. Now, therefore, please heed also the voice of your maidservant. And let, and let me set a piece of bread before you and eat that you may have strength. When you go on your way, in other words, get up, get out of here. Um, you know, you can't be here. If you die here, I could not only be killed for being a spiritualist, but also an accessory to your death. Her alibi, 
is gone if he dies. Get out of here. 23, but he refused and said, I will not eat. So his servants, together with a woman, urged him, and he heeded their voice. Then he rose from the ground and sat on the bed. Now, at least he gets up, and there's no bed, I don't think. I think there's your cushions around. And he sits on that, and he's coming to his senses somewhat. And then in 24, it says here, Now the woman had a fatted calf in the house. Well, just so happens we got a fatted calf. And she hastened to kill it. And she took flour and kneaded it and baked it, uh, baked it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Why unleavened bread? Because there was no time to let that flour rise and fall, rise and fall. It was time for Saul to get out of here, get back to your own camp, lead your own army, and do what you are supposed to do, and that is to lead Israel into battle. You cannot stay here. Move. Get on. So she makes him leavened bread. They eat, they ride, and they, and they go. And they rose and went away that night. What's going to happen? We see David is between a hard place and a rock. Is he going to be a man of honor? Is he going to ride with the Philistines and kill off his own people? Or will he be showing his true colors, if you will, and as an Israelite? Will Saul go into battle knowing that he's going to die? We won't know that until the next couple of chapters. So I'm telling you, this is a book of intrigue. Stay tuned. Follow us again. And if you want to cheat a little bit, study the next couple, three chapters, because there's only three left, and you will get the answers. If you want to follow along with us, be with us next week, and we will find more of David and Saul. Until then, may God bless you richly. Amen.